are back. Glory be to God. So we were on live earlier and we were in our book, The Normal Christian Life. We're doing an extended version of our live because now we're going to do a bit of a Bible study. Um, in our reading, the author mentioned three eclipses from, well, four different passages from um, the Gospels um, that mention dying to self. Well, not even dying to self. It mentioned bearing the cross and how bearing the cross is in relation to our soul. We have hopefully the understanding that we have been crucified with Christ being past tense. For those who have accepted Christ, not everyone has accepted Christ. So if you haven't accepted Christ, this isn't going to apply to you. If you have accepted Christ, you should have the understanding that the cross of Christ includes crucifying the old man. The old man is a source of life, a source of living life out of the flesh. So the old man is the flesh, the carnal man has been crucified. Past tense, it's a finished work. That's outlined in the Bible. But the focal of today's live was bearing the cross, which is something we need to do daily, which is the tense of now. So biblically, why is that two different things that seemingly is contradictory? Because as mentioned, Christ being crucified and us being crucified with Christ deals with the flesh bearing the cross daily which is something we subject ourselves to after we've accepted christ we continue to have a desire to know him and our seeking him and coming to know him clearly we come into an understanding of who we are we renew our mind we go through this process of death and resurrection again continually, which is bearing the cross on our soul life. So our soul, mind, will, and emotions is also a source of life we can choose to live from. So we have distinguished two sources of life, the flesh and the soul. The flesh is dealt with by the cross and that being a finished work. We have to continue to grow in Christ to come into an understanding of what it means to continually bear the cross on our soul life so that we're not living out of self, out of our own understanding, doing what we want, how we want, but we are learning how to yield ourselves to the spirit of God and learning how to live life out of the spirit of God to where God's life is not simply in us. I have the life of God, but no, God's very life is now our life. We live out from the spirit of God manifesting the son of god i.e christ that's why he's the first fruit of many brethren we should resemble christ and the attributes of christ and what did he resemble an attribute god himself because he was the son of god amen amen so we're going to look into some 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 scriptures concerning those things we're also going to look at other scriptures that paul outlined that gives us context from paul's perspective and from his experience of of what that looks like in ministry basically ministry is just serving the lord as a believer in the lord we all when when we're truly engrafted by the by the word of god concerning our born againness being born again of the spirit we have this natural inclination and desire to want to serve god to want to give him our life to want to be used by god to want to be a vessel for god to want to tell people about the reality of god that comes by way of his son and we can't do that if death and resurrection is not marking our steps because baptism, death and resurrection, is not just a physical thing that takes place. It is a principal thing, which can be a practical thing that steers our life in Christ. Amen? Amen. So, with that being stated, we're going to look at Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Matthew 8, 32 through 35. Luke 17, 32 through 34 and John 12, 24 through 26, starting at Matthew 10, 34 through 39. And the Bible that I have on hand 
is the King James, so it's going to be a bit interesting with the wordplay. But Lord, give me the grace and the wisdom to share what needs to be shared, Lord. So Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Amen. Um, and before we hop in, let us pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to fellowship here on TikTok. I pray, Lord, that you enlighten us tonight concerning your word. Um, Holy Spirit, I pray and invite you into our heart meditations um, to reveal the word to us. Please Please touch our consciousness. Help us to become sensitive to your speaking, to your movement, and to your light so that we can perceive what you are trying to reveal of Christ. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your long suffering and your forbearance. Help us to understand that you can't empathize with our human nature, not to give us an excuse to maintain a defeated state, but please help us to understand the love you have for us and that we can be rooted and grounded in that love abiding in you and keeping your commandments, understanding that with the demand comes a certain type of grace that is allotted to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory be to God. So uh, Matthew 10, 34 through 39, this is Christ speaking, obviously. It says, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they as of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So I have a feeling that all four of these passages are going to be clearly um, in a crypt from different disciples of the same thing. So it's different perspectives. Amen. I want to say in this reality that we're speaking of, the Lord is low-key speaking in a parable. He's not taking it literally, like he's not expecting you to take it literally, but there is an aspect to which you should come to a conclusion that, for example, here's an aspect, you value God's insights over you than that of your own families. For instance, does that make sense? Um, where he says in verse 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Um, that sword is important because that sword is the word. It divides, it cuts through joint and marrow, dividing spirit and soul. Um, you can also couple this with the statement that Christ makes in a different gospel where he says, I did not come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. That term fulfill means to teach properly, not simply to uphold it, but to teach properly. So the 613 commandments, that's the law. Christ did not come to get rid of that law. That law is still very much relevant. Amen, amen, amen. But that law has not been perfected. No man has been able to fulfill that law perfectly. In fulfilling that law, that's why there's rabbis and things of that nature, because they were to teach the law. They couldn't keep the law perfectly, so how could they teach it perfectly? So how could they have fulfilled the law? Only Christ could have. So this sword he comes bearing is the word, because quite literally Christ is the word of God in the flesh. So that sword that divides, it's speaking about taking the, the, the laws, the word of God, basically, and discerning it, interpreting it, and understanding it. 
Does that make sense? So the word has a literal side and a spiritual side, a literal interpretation and a spiritual interpretation. For instance, the word of God is logos and it holds rama. But if you don't have the spirit of God living inside of you, when you go to the word, you're only going to get the logos, which is still helpful to an extent. But that word you're reading is going to be only applied literally, which ultimately is only going to end up killing you. The very thing that promised life proved to be death as in Romans 7, because when we read the word of God with no spiritual insight from the spirit of God, giving us an understanding of that word, we're left to our own vain imaginations. We're left at the whims of teachers and preachers and random women on TikTok doing Bible studies. Amen. If you don't know how to take their insights, other people's insights, and present it to the spirit of God himself, to God himself, to get the proper discernment for his word to be that sword to cut off the flesh. That's why the letter kill us. There's, there's a veil. There's a flesh there, right? It's going to be really, really hard to truly walk with God because those commandments are not done away with the moment you confess and say that Jesus is Lord. If anything, the moment you say and confess... And believe with all your heart that Jesus is Lord. You die in Christ to the flesh. And you're free to walk by the Spirit and live life with Christ in the Spirit. For the sole purpose of following him. To be taught by him concerning the word. The law is now instead of written on tablets of stone. Just on the outside written on paper. He can now give you Rama, the living word of God, the spoken word of God, written on the tablets of your heart. So when he goes on to say things like, take up your cross, it's talking about soul life. Or what is next after you've accepted Christ? Amen. Amen. So the next script we're going to look at is Mark 8, 32 through 35. Oh, and I have a pen. Amen. Let me underline a few things real quick, like, in case we have to go back and forth with a sword. Make that term variance. worthy of me. And also one other thing I want to point out is something my apostle pointed out. Um, when it talks about when he says you're not worthy of me if you don't bear your cross, that points to the fact that we can be worthy of Christ. Like we can be worthy of God. We don't always have to have a, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Because that points out to your own unworthiness. Now, don't get it twisted. We need to reverence the Lord. We can't, like, we need to have a certain honor and fear of God, understanding that apart from him and outside of him, my works are as filthy rags. I am nothing without you. I am fully and utterly dependent on you. I cannot move without you. That's like the crux of bearing the cross. That's the purpose of bearing the cross, which is to die to self, understanding that in self, I can do nothing that actually is in union with God, that benefits God in any way. Not that he needs my benefit, but the kingdom can be expanded by me if I choose to be a vessel and an instrument of him. Me being an instrument of God, the only thing I can do is choose to submit to him and learn how to be submitted in him. So I learn, I relearn how to think. I relearn how to deal with emotions. I relearn how to decide and problem solve. With Christ now at the focal, no longer me. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, so I no longer live being my own soul life, my own aspirations, but it's Christ who lives in me because I'm now yielded. I'm now yoked up. I'm bearing the cross and I'm walking and following after Christ. That's the difference. Amen. So Mark 10, I think it was 9, if I'm being right. It's Mark 8, 32 through 35. Glory be to God. (laughs) 
It says, and he spake that saying open, openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about, and I'm, I'm in chapter eight. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, "Excuse me, excuse me, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men, are the things that be of soulish activity." And again, bearing the cross is about bearing the cross on your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, which is the life of man. When God breathed life into Adam, he became a living soul. Amen? So, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, that same shall save it. So in this script, Peter is, you know, technically from our perspective of, 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 of human perspective, clock it. He's not doing anything wrong. He just found out his Lord is going to be wrongly accused and die a gruesome death on a cross. And his Lord is willingly going to allow this to happen. And as his disciple, he doesn't want that to happen. He loves the Lord. So he's saying, you don't need to do that. Don't. Don't, don't, don't do that. I, I, you don't do that. Right? So... Peter is coming from a place of emotion and using his own thinking and understanding. It's ironic that prior to this bout of, lack for a better word, temper tantrum, Peter's throwing a bit of a temper tantrum right now when he finds out that the Lord is going to be crucified. Right before that, the Lord totally rewarded him because he was saying you know people say i'm this and people say i'm that but what do you guys say i am none of the disciples knew what to say but peter spoke up he said you are the lord you are the son of god and jesus rewarded him by saying that is correct only this only you only received that from the father the spirit of god revealed that to you no man revealed that to you and upon you i will build my rock that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a good compliment. Nothing but two minutes later, he's rebuking Peter, calling him the devil. Now, mind you, the Lord is, is insightful, so he wasn't calling Peter the devil. But through Peter's lack of discernment of his own thoughts and where they're coming from, you know, the devil used that moment to plant a seed to try to get Christ from doing the thing that would undo any work of the devil. So the devil was using Peter in that moment to go against the word of God, to go against God's will. And Christ clocked the fact that Satan was in the midst. So he rebuked Satan saying, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Christ going to the cross is something that God desired. It's the whole point and the whole purpose of Christ coming down. Is for him to reach that point of physical crucifixion and ultimately resurrection. For Peter to say the opposite and desire the opposite, to voice the opposite and come into agreement with the opposite of God's will is satanic in nature. And again, we're speaking about bearing the cross because after he rebukes Peter in private, he calls the rest of the disciples and the rest of the men, the assembly, the audience, the congregation to himself 
to make this claim again. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in that moment, Peter, Peter was not after what God was after. He was not in alignment with the will of God. He was not in alignment with his proclaimed Lord. He allowed his soul life to take on its own thing, to voice what it wanted, which ultimately is something Satan desired, which is he shouldn't go to the cross. So your soul life can be a, 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 an iffy thing if it's not in check as a Christian. That's why Satan prowls around like a lion seeking whom he can destroy. What cracks and what crevices are not truly submitted unto God? What cracks and what crevices truly has no water fell on? We're not even talking about doors that are still open that your flesh delights in. We're talking a little bit more microscopic concerning thought patterns, concerning emotional traumas, and personal willfulness and pride. Those are areas as well. When scripture says the heart is the most deceitful place, it's not a joke. Because the heart includes your mind, will, and emotions, but also your conscience. And your conscience is, as you thought, the soul was microscopic, the the conscience is forensic you know in like cold cases and crime shows they the autopsy people or the coroners they come in with their forensic science kits that's like dealing with the conscience you feel what i'm saying so consciously peter was like yeah you shouldn't go to the cross though you, you will not die but that was that's completely wayward so in order to bear the cross, we have to fundamentally deny self. So when thoughts come, we have to pause. We have to take every thought captive and inspect it. We have to take every emotion and check it. We have to look at our actions and reflect upon them. And look at our motives so that when we turn and repent, because it's bound to happen, that's part of bearing the cross, those are true changes that take place that are stakes in the ground for God, not stakes in the ground for self. Because anywhere self is erected, the spirit of God cannot be projected and demonstrated. And more so, it's just a gray area for Satan to slowly infiltrate. And that's not what we want. We don't want to get to the end of the road, i.e. we die and meet with Christ. And he says, get away from me, I never knew you. Because if you're a Christian who simply confesses, I'm saved by the by the blood of Christ, and that's it, but you have no real understanding of God and what that even means. Like you haven't taken the time to look at what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean that I'm saved by grace and through faith? What does it mean that the blood has cleansed me of all past, present, and future sins? What is the point of the Holy Spirit and how do I cooperate with the Holy Spirit? What does it mean for everything in the old testament to be a type and shadow of what is to come what does it mean that there's no jew nor gentile nor greek nor whatever and nor nor female nor male like what does that really mean like what is what is god's heart really after why am i really here like what is it what does it mean if you don't have any like desire after you've been saved to seek out the face of god all the more knowing you have the option to do so and to grow spiritually, Lord, what are we doing? <laughs> Does that make sense? Because when you go down that, that rabbit hole of like, I want to know God for myself, like for myself. Everyone's saying all this. Preachers are saying all of that. Though even the word says that, but like, I still don't know for myself. Like, I want to seek out God's face. I want to seek out the Lord's face. I want to know his heart. If you haven't had that like moment where it's like, I'm going to be bold here and just go in. Um, you have to question if you really have accepted Christ. You just have to. You have to. 
And by you questioning it, it shouldn't cause you to be condemned. It should cause you to be convicted because now you are inquisitive of the Lord and you want to know for yourself even more. That just means you're going deeper in the Lord, which is a beautiful thing. He will, he will meet you. He will reveal himself to you if you seek him with all your heart. Even as deceitful and chaotic as it may be currently, if you lay all those things aside, deny self low-key, it's a principle, and seek him, he will meet you and you will experience death. You will experience resurrection. You will experience Christ. You will experience Christ in the way that he experienced life. You'll experience the Holy Spirit moving in you to where you can start tracking him. Like, oh, ah, oh. you'll become enlightened. You'll have an understanding of God, not just of all these different semantics, which are needed. Like we need to be able to break it down. Amen. So we can live it out. Glory be to God. But the treasure is God's heart and understanding God's heart, like in having God. Like that's 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 life in Christ is relationship with God. Amen. That's the whole point. So to follow Christ is to bear your cross, understanding, yes, I have been crucified with Christ. Certain things are already a finished work that I won't need to redo because those are dead works. But seeking the Lord, bearing the cross is a soul thing, which is a continual thing, which elicits work out of the spirit of God. And those works are not dead. Those are works that are needed. James speaks about, show me your works without faith or your faith without works. There you go. And I'll show you my works by my faith because faith is accompanied by works. And bearing your cross is a work. Let me tell you that much. It's a work. And it's a work that's fundamentally needed before we can grow and mature in the Lord concerning other services and servicing and serving God and other works like ministry and worship and whatever your gift or calling is and how God wants to use it and being a vessel and an instrument unto God in whatever capacity that looks like, whether it be a mom, a father, a pilot, a, a teacher, a, a homemaker, a designer, an artist, a, a actor, a, a interior designer, like whatever it is, it could be in video and audio it, it could be in jewelry making it could be in hair stuff it it could be in ebooks it, i mean it, there's so many things a farmer glory be to god so many things so amen the next one is luke 17 32 through 34 you guys good still amen Because God has a call on your life. God has a purpose for your life. God not just wants to use your life, amen. He wants your life because he has life to give you. That's why in all of these scriptures, the next two that we're going to look at, these are crypts. He's saying, for those who love their life shall lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake shall have it. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. So Luke 17, 32 through 34. Coffee break. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Shabaka. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. The woman shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Amen. I think, I, I think it was only 32 through 34. Glory be to God. So Lot's wife is a good one. Lot's wife is a good one. Also parabolic. Um, not sure exactly what the spiritual meaning behind it is, but I understand the, not the carnal understanding, but the, the, the basic understanding. Amen. That's one thing I am learning with um, this church is parables 
are earthly things with heavenly meanings. So a lot of the understandings and insights I have, they do come from a spiritual place, but it's so much deeper than I even thought. Um, there's so many layers and depths within the Lord and understanding the Lord. It's crazy. So even the things I share, they truly are rudimentary, guys. They truly are elementary. Like, honestly, they, they really, really are. So, for example, Lot's wife, we know the story. We know the story. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy this town. I'm saving your family. Do not look back or you will become a pillar of salt. Basically, you will die. Lot's wife, though I'm sure she tried in her own strength, in her own energy, with everything she had in her own soul, as much as she tried to not look back, she could not help it. She caved. Baby girl looked back. She craned her neck. She craned her neck. She did a 180. And baby girl she died now we know hopefully that that can be symbolic symbolic that if god brings you out of something don't turn back looking at what you done got out of it was killing you god is preserving your life by bringing you out of it why are you looking back still fawning still desiring something of it you know, when we do that nowadays, thank the Lord we don't become a pillow star assault. I would have died a long time ago. He's so merciful and so forbearing. But we need to look at that as a prime example on truly what not to do because baby girl became a pillar assault. Now, obviously that thing, that town she was coming out of, it can be referenced and seen as our own soul life. Not just the flesh. That goes without saying. That's the fleshly nature. Don't look back at it because you will be caught up back in it. Where you set your eyes, you will go. Where you set your mind, your emotions and your will will follow. So your eyes will naturally direct you as well. So if your eye be single, your whole body be full of light. But if your eye be evil, looking at things that are not Christ. Your whole body be full of darkness. Now, if the light that is in you is darkness, how dark is your heart, basically? So, when we accept the Lord, we go through the whole rigmarole. We say the prayer, the sinner's prayer, and we believe with all our heart that Jesus is Lord and King of Kings. Amen. Hallelujah. And we get a nice little tingly feeling of the Holy Spirit because hopefully the Holy Spirit revealed the reality of that to where you are truly born again because you see in the light of Christ you need him because you're in a body of death, which is the flesh. Your soul is fully bound to it enslaved by it so you see the need of a savior to be liberated and set free though in that moment you don't understand the reality of what that means which is to have a spiritual eye to discern the word of god and to really take on the character and function of christ that's the point where you know you've done all that you got that nice little feeling you continue to follow him because that's the point of being saved, is to continue to grow in the stature of Christ, i.e. for Christ to mature in you. And for Christ to mature in you, you fundamentally need the word of God because he is the word of God. Right? In order to do that, you cannot, one, look back to the things of the flesh. You cannot look back to your old lifestyle i.e. ways of thinking, ways of dealing with emotions, and ways of doing a thing, how you decide to do a thing, how you problem solve. Your soul life, once you've accepted Christ, hopefully you get the understanding that your flesh is dead and you learn to deal with things of the flesh because those are truly minuscule things in light of the glory of God and what he's really trying to do within the kingdom. You know, we have to mature like we always are going to need milk. 
which deals with the morals, the sin nature and things of that to keep that nailed to the cross. We always have to keep nailing to the cross. But while we do that, we have to continually bear the cross on our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions. And we have our own thoughts and precepts. God has his own thoughts and precepts. By nailing the flesh to the cross, it already being dead, we now are free to be mingled and joined with God, to be yoked up. And to be yoked is to be taught of God. And to be taught and learn and receive from God the very virtues and things of God, to walk in the authority of God. <sighs> Our soul needs to die to self because naturally our soul, it, it doesn't really want what God wants. Our heart may want what God wants, but until we learn to submit to God, we're never going to learn how to walk in the will of God. And if I lost you, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't break it down more than I already have. <laughs> Pray on it. <laughs> so when it comes to Lot's wife, I believe the reason why Christ is saying remember Lot's wife. Because anything, when you accepted Christ and you're choosing to follow Christ, it is a daily bearing the cross. We have to remember that doesn't feel good. Dying does not feel good. And Satan and the flesh and your own vain imaginations are going to be right there as you're dying presenting things of the former self whether it was easier back then it was more delightful it was quicker it wasn't as hard. Everyone liked me when I was like that. Everyone thought highly of me when I did things this way. Whatever the case is, I was making more money doing this and whatever it is. You have to not look at those things as more valuable than what you're gaining in the Lord. Because there are aspects and moments where it's very tempting to turn back and be infatuated by what was. Does that make sense? So we have to look at these types of, of eclipse in a very practical way, but also putting it into perspective how important and decisive we need to be when we choose of our own violation to commit to God. Another thing I'm gonna point out, Adam and Eve, we know it is symbolic for Christ and the church, amen. Clearly it's symbolic for husband and wife. Recently, I was able to put into perspective that Adam and Eve is symbolic of our inward status as well and of our um, inward dynamic, I should say, not status, where Eve is our soul and the life of our soul. Eve is the life of our soul. Adam is our spirit man. Eve was deceived by the cunning, by the cunning of Satan to the point she didn't have a sincere devotion to God or i.e. to Adam. So in the same way, we are spiritual people, spiritual beings, not even people, possessing a soul, living in a body. When we get born again and we accept Christ and commit our life unto Christ, we are born again, not in the soul or in the flesh. The flesh is as good as dead. The soul is continually being renewed. The spirit is born again. So therefore we are a new creation in Christ spiritually to now we can live life out of our spirit man. Our soul needs to be submitted to the spirit, just like 
Eve should have been submitted to Adam, i.e. Adam should have been walking in his authority over Eve concerning the serpent. But that's a different topic or a different day. Eve was not submitted to Adam, let alone the word that she instinctively understood in her heart because she was deceived by Satan. So in the same way, though we are born again in the spirit, our soul can still be deceived by Satan to the point we don't have a pure and simple devotion to the Lord, which is a heart posture, a desire and a motive to stay yoked with God. Lot had a wife. <laughs> Lot's wife looked back. Um, I can't say if this is biblically sound um, that Lot and, and his wife is representative of Christ in the church or even of our spirit and our soul in this way. I don't have any, any backing to back that up. I'm sorry, I don't. But... The Lord dropped it in my spirit that again, this woman is being led astray and she's dying. <laughs> so I wanted to highlight that as well. Lot heard the word that Abraham sent like, yo, God ain't happy with this place. And he got, y'all need to go. And the only instruction is do not look back or you will turn into a pillar of salt. Lot didn't look back. Lot was full on steam ahead, full on steam ahead. Our spirit is willing, our flesh may be weak, but our soul, that's, that's why the flesh becomes weak, like the expression of the flesh is weakened because our soul is still linked to the flesh. So if we set our mind on things of the flesh, it will be flesh. If we set our mind on things of the spirit, it will be spirit. In this situation, all I'm saying is Lot's wife, remember her. And understand the lesson in that. Because it's important in your walk with Christ. If you're saved, amen, and you are a Christian, you are born again, you have some revelation knowledge, you have a relationship with God, you know the highest truth concerning the gospel of Christ, that's good and dandy. I'm sure a lot of transformation has happened. God wants to transform our lives in so many more ways on such deeper, deeper, intimate things. He can't do that if we're still entertaining the flesh and we have no idea what it means to bear the cross. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So get your eyes off of the former things. Get your eyes off of self. Easier said than done. And again, the process of death is not fun. It does not feel good. And you will be tempted to not do it for whatever reason, no matter the circumstance. But if you're going to be committed to the Lord, we have to understand how much the Lord is looking at you to keep your word. There's scripture in Ecclesiastes where it says, it's better to not make a vow to God than to make a vow and not keep it. Don't say you're going to do something if you're not going to do it. God is long suffering. He is forbearing. He is merciful. Every time he gives you revelation concerning his word, every time he imparts love into you, every time he gives you an understanding, every time he gives you wisdom and insight, that's mercy for our souls. Amen. So we all fall short of the glory of God. It happens. But at some point, we have to let our yeas be yeas and our nays be nays. By Lot and his wife choosing to run out of this town for the safety and sanctity of their own lives because God was giving them mercy they made a conscious decision to follow that voice, to follow God. Somewhere along the way, Lot's wife lost sight of that because she put her eyes backwards and did the one thing God said, hey, I'm only asking you to do one thing. Don't look back. She couldn't help it. 
soul life was too erect. By her even looking back, it showed she still had a desire for that life, for what she was leaving behind. And through that desire, though truly understandable, just like Peter, Lord, I don't want you to die. Don't go to the cross. Understandable why the man would feel that way. He got rebuked. Satan, get behind me because you care not for the things of God, but for men. And when it comes to our soul life, that's why it's so tricky. Because, yeah, we can empathize and understand, like, why I think this way and why I'm like this. And so discerning our own soul and having knowledge of self is super important, but it also can lead itself into making excuses to stay the same. And that's just not a thing. That's not the point. God doesn't highlight certain things to us concerning our soul simply just to sympathize and empathize with us, but also to bring us to a point of repentance to where we truly turn and don't look back. And I'm preaching to myself, too. I hope y'all don't think I'm just like, eh, eh, eh. like, it's for me, too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh! But you guys are getting it, right? <laughs> Amen. So I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Again, don't look at that too literally. It is supposed to be as an example at the time when Christ comes back, there's going to be the wheats and there's going to be the tares. They grow together, but one stands and one falls. Long story made short. Long story made short. Many will come to the Lord saying, Lord, Lord, do not prophesy and cast out demons and do miracles in your name. And those things actually happen. Like we really prophesied in your name and the prophecy came to true. We really, you know, casted out demons in your name and demons truly fled. We really perform miracles in your name, in your character, and in your function. And those miracles took place. And yet the Lord is going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. What does that mean? It means they did not even know God because they did not truly live a life that bore the cross, that had the mark of baptism, of death and resurrection. And how we know what is true that we're speaking, i.e. the gospel, is by testing the spirit. And the word of God. And honestly, the best way to know the truth of a thing is to check the source of a thing. You always have to check the source of a thing. The best way to deal with any question of confusion is to look at the source. I don't think the rapture is a thing. I don't. I don't think I don't think we're just going to get caught up. I don't think that's a thing. But but look into it. Like what's the source of the doctrine of the rapture? That source only dates back a hundred couple years ago. Paul never spoke about a rapture. Does that make sense? So we have to look at the interpretation of things as well. So that's why I mentioned like Lot's wife, like Lot and and his wife, I can't say that's representative of the spirit and the soul or even Christ in the church because I haven't biblically found that interpretation anywhere. Does that make sense? But it can be likened to it. So any anything I'm saying here even now, y'all, y'all should only take it back to the Lord because that's the source of your life as a Christian. If you're not a Christian, then it doesn't then it doesn't apply. But if you're a Christian, all things need to be taken back unto the Lord because only he can confirm nor deny a thing by his spirit. That's why there's gonna be many coming to him saying, did we not prophesy? Have we not cast it out? Did we not do miracles in your name? And he's gonna say, get away from me. I never knew you. If you don't know God enough to the point where you can come boldly to his throne to get answers to your questions, then you don't know God. You don't know his son. Because the only way to the father is through the son. So if you don't know his son, 
you're going to have a really hard time following him. Like you're going to have a hard time following Christ if you don't know him. So the whole point of all of this is to know him. All these other extra things that come with knowing him is beautiful and needed because it points back to him. But again, as in 2 Corinthians eleven three, let's not lose sight of a pure and simple devotion towards the Lord. All of these eclipses we're looking at within the Gospels are talking about if any of you loves your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. The first one we read was in Matthew talking about if you love your father, father, <laughs> your father or mother or brother or sister, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law more than me, you're not worthy of me. Christ is the reward. Knowing God is our sustenance. That's our, that's, that's what we want. That's our ultimate desire. So all of this, bearing the cross and all of the semantics I'm pointing out concerning our soul life and the functions of those things and how hopefully it's helping for you guys to put into perspective because it helped me put certain things in perspective on how to walk with God concerning these principles that God lays out as a foundation of our faith in his word. It's truly just for the aim of knowing him more. That's the depth. That's why Paul speaks about in Romans or somewhere where he says, I pray you come to know the length, width, height, and breadth of God's love. It is in Romans. It's in Romans 8. Amen? Amen. Um, the next one is John 12, 24 through 26. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Okay? One thing um, a preacher said that always kind of stuck with me, anytime the Lord is speaking and he says, verily, verily, you want to pay attention to what's being said. Verily, verily, in some translations, truly, truly, in other translations, where truly, truly, I tell you, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that means take note, take note. That means pay attention, pay attention. So verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This one is truly a parable. It speaks about the word of God. It speaks about the life of Christ. And furthermore, it speaks about our own life that we take on in Christ. So looking at Christ... He was a single corn. He was the, the only begotten son of God. He had to die by way of crucifixion. If he did not die, right? If he did not die, he would abide alone. He would have been the one and only son of God to ever live. But since he died, and if he died, he would bear much fruit, i.e. through his death and resurrection and ascension, he would be able to impart his spirit, which is the very spirit of God, into other believers. Thereby, through him bearing fruit of many more sons. That's why he's the first begotten, the firstborn of many. Amen? Firstborn of many. So every time we are, 
we are so anytime we're born anytime someone's born again they become a child of god they become a son of god and as we follow the lord and bear our cross we maintain that relationship as a son of god because now we're being brought up in the spirit of god bearing the image of christ i.e the image of god so in the same way if you if you have a seed but you don't plant it it won't grow into something new it won't bear any fruit if you have an apple seed and you want many apples from this apple tree you have to put it in the ground and that seed while in the ground it will die meaning it's going to break open it's going to become something altogether different it's gonna die that seed is no longer a seed it's now a tree the tree that bears fruit of apples for you because that's what you wanted amen amen in the same way if we accept Christ we have to die like a glow stick to an extent. You get a glow stick, you buy it with the imper like with the intention of it glowing. You want it to glow a pretty little color. In order for that stick to glow, you have to buy it first. Once you buy it and you have it, you have to open it. Okay, you bought it, you opened it, now you have it in your possession, but if you use it to cook with, it's not gonna make it glow. If you use it as an instrument it's not like you can't you have to break it you have to crack it up it's going to look completely different it's not going to be the same because now it's doing what it's meant to do now that is broken and cracked up and it's glowing though and that's what you wanted so spiritually speaking Ooh, that's deep, Lord. <laughs> Amen. It's the same thing over and over again. But the word of God is a seed. Okay. And now, who was the seed? Christ. Because who is Christ? Christ is, is the word of God made flesh, literally. That's who Christ is. He is the living word of God. Now, spiritually speaking, when we go into our word. This word is seed. The seed needs to be planted in our heart. Mind, will, emotions in our conscience is the soil in which the seed is planted in so the Spirit of God is the one imparting the seed in us when that seed is in us it has to be it has to die now if anything what if the seed dying is it being cracked open and the Spirit of God is the one giving us the interpretation of the Word of God that's the that that is basically the seed being planted in us and being broken so that it can bear fruit that's why you know the lord gave the parable of farmer sow seed on different types of ground and based on the ground that's going to be the condition of the fruit he's speaking about the word of god being implanted in us and what type of heart we have will determine the cultivatedness of that seed right right so the holy spirit is the one that breaks open the seed so the word of god that's the logos if you break it open and get to the meat of it it's no longer a seed it's something new but then you get to the rhema the living word of god to where you can write the long on the tablets of our hearts and on our mind that's it being implanted in our heart and that word is living and active sharp because again, the Lord came to bring a sword. Matthew. Sharp enough to divide joint and marrow, 
soul and spirit <laughs> to cut off the flesh to be circumcised so that we can discern and grow spiritually <laughs> amen so there's many in that in the dying process as well when that seed is planted in us so it's like death and death and death and death and death it's like inception to an extent y'all seen that movie inception does that make sense? Anyhow, with that being stated, when the word of God is truly implanted in our hearts and it takes root, glory be to God, it takes root and starts bearing fruit, we will naturally be ushered into the reality of bearing the cross, which is dying. So that we can walk in a resurrected life. In Christ which is a spiritual thing because now our soul is submitted to the Spirit of God and through this process in our like we can learn in our own not in our own understanding but in our mind we can comprehend the spiritual things of God to where we can articulate it for one but also truly walk with God and learn how to walk in the Spirit of God to where we're spirit led Basically becoming one with God. Which is why bearing the cross daily is a thing. Amen. Because if you're not bearing the cross daily, you're not really coming into unity with God. You're not really in covenant with God. So when the time comes for you to give account... If you are in true unity with God, if you are truly in covenant with God, you don't have to worry about, get away from me, I never knew you. Now, we need to sort out our salvation with fear and trembling. We should never get to the point where we feel we are perfect. We should always have this aim of being perfect because to be perfect simply means to be mature. We're able to be mature in the Lord spiritually. We're able to grow in maturity. We should never get to the point where we're prideful and deceived in our own soul to think that we don't need any type of dependence on the Lord in any area, i.e., let's talk about forgiveness. You should never get to the point where it's like, oh, I know how to forgive people just fine. I mean, we should be able to know how to forgive people just fine. But when the Lord brings up an item where it's like, okay, forgive this person, and he already forgave them 10 years ago, we shouldn't dismiss those convictions because clearly he wouldn't be bringing it up if we haven't been perfected in that area. So that's why bearing the cross daily is so important because you may have patience in one area but not have patience in this area and this area you don't have a lot of patience in, you may not need to be refined in that area until 10 years from now. And when the Lord brings it up 10 years from now, you can't look at the Lord as if like, no, I don't need to do that because I'm perfectly patient in this area. Well, no, you're not perfectly patient in patience because you're not patient in this area. Does that make sense? So there's always a layer of humbleness and there's always a need of having a repented heart towards the Lord. A repented heart towards God is the nucleus of intimacy with God. If you want to build intimacy with God to where you come to know God. If you break down that word in the Greek or the Hebrew, it talks about intimacy with God. Like literal sex. Like it's a thing. Don't be weird about it. It's spiritual understanding but physical examples. To really know God... In an intimate thing, the heart posture needs to have repentance as like the crux of it. So if you ever are at a point where you feel you don't need to be humbled and you don't feel the need to like repent, especially when God is highlighting something that he doesn't like or he wants you to walk in, because for him to highlight it to you means you're not doing it. And it's a correction because he chastised those whom he loves, just like a father would chastise their, their son, their child, right? It's a relationship. Um, 
we just have to be really mindful of that because as we get into the word of God and we start getting an understanding of spiritual things, not just physical, literal things, it's very easy to get prideful and not understand where the pride is linked. Because again, the heart is a deceitful place. That's why having a pure heart towards the Lord is so important. And it's not weird because if a husband and wife and their union, including the literal physical intimacy aspect of it, is representative of Christ in the church, we need to look at that because it's principles and it helps deepen our understanding. Because relationship with the Lord is 10 times more intimate than you can ever be with another physical person, point blank. It goes far beyond the flesh. So if you think it weird and it, you're rub, like, and it's rubbing you the wrong way, quite literally, there is a perverted mindset in you that has to be dealt with. And maybe this type of talk is too premature for those who are still operating carnally, which is understandable. This live truly isn't for everyone and spiritual interpretation of things not everyone can get. That's why people come to the Bible, come to the living word of God, which is the seed of God. Because when you get imparted the revelation of God, you become pregnant with something in the spirit. And at some point you're going to give birth to that. Just like if you plant a seed and you water it properly, it will grow and bear its own fruit in its due time to where you're going to see the change in the seed. It's no longer the seed. You're no longer the same once you truly accept Christ and you follow after him concerning the word of God. You can't, again, that's why people come to the word of God and they leave unchanged. They go to church and they come as they are, but they leave the same. Nothing changes in them because they, they don't have the spirit of God moving inside of them to give them impartation. And that's just what a beast like sometimes. You feel what I'm saying? Like, there are certain things for me as well that I'm still learning spiritually that I need to die to the carnal mindset of. So this isn't a knock, but it's also not weird unless you make it weird. And that, that becomes a you problem. That has nothing to do with me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So um, with that, it's about 12 o'clock. I think we're going to stop it there. That was the last scripture. Um. Look at these scriptures, y'all. It's really important. It's all speaking about the same thing, but you can see how it's presented slightly differently and it gives different examples to point to the heart and the reality of what the scripture is meaning. So when you read scripture, please, for the love of God, truly, and I'm not saying that, out of drama and, and vanity, but ask the Holy Spirit for enlightenment. Ask the Holy Spirit for help. Understanding, I look crazy. <laughs> Understanding the word because there's no way we can know God without his spirit. There's no, there's just no way possible. There's just no way. You can't. And I highly recommend if, if you don't plan to invite the Holy Spirit to give you understanding, don't read the word of God. Maybe I shouldn't say that because that will come. Continue reading your word, but invite the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. The Holy Spirit is sent and given to us for the purpose, not just of comforting us, which he can do very, very well, but so that he can lead and guide us into all the truth. Into all the truth. No, I saw the cat. I saw the cat. Amen. So you can't you can't go to the word of God, the infallible word of God, the truth of God. And leave without understanding what you just read. You don't have to. You can. We do it a lot. But that shouldn't be the norm. As a child of God, we should know the voice of our father. We should know the voice of the God we serve. We should know the Holy Spirit and how he moves. We should know the character and function of Christ so that when he is being demonstrated in our life because we're watching for him, because we know how to seek him, we know how to be pursued by him, that we cannot just imitate him, but walk in the likeness and the true reality of him because now that is how we live life. 
I hope that's making sense. I think it's making sense. I hope you guys have a great night. I appreciate all of you guys. I love all of you guys. I'll be praying for y'all. I pray y'all pray for me because your girl will be going through it like the next person do. Um, and stay yoked up with the Lord. Glory be to God. Stay yoked. Stay yoked. Stay yoked. You're welcome. Yes, yes, yes. I would stay for a QA and a because there's a lot of y'all, y'all. A lot of y'all stuck out with your girl. I appreciate. God is good. Amen. That just shows when the Lord wants people to get his word, he will bring people to get his word. So whatever you got, hold in the light of the Lord and allow the word to be nurtured and you continue, continue, continue. Um, but yeah, I would stay to do a QA, and a but I've been on for like three hours now. So I love you guys. I will see you guys on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Central Time and also on Thursday at 9 p.m. Central Time. Appreciate you guys again. Be blessed. Stay blessed. Be safe. Bye-bye.